and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. sing for all that you've done for me who brings our chaos back into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king above all the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory. in recollection of jesus entry into jerusalem every generation of believers once yearly welcomes christ anew on this day which we call palm sunday Today marks the beginning of Holy Week, the week prior to Christ's crucifixion, the most holy season of the Christian year. Scripture says, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on the donkey's colt. This is what God promised long ago, and now it is time. The promised Messiah is here, the Savior of the world. Hosanna, praise God. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Blessed is the King of Israel. Let us sing and praise him.
from heaven you came, helpless babe. Entered our world, your glory veiled, not to be served, but to serve. And give your life that we might live. This is our God, the servant King. He calls us now to follow Him, to bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the servant. Not my will, but yours, he said. This is our God, the servant king. He calls us now to follow him, to bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the servant. His hands and His feet, the scars that speak of sacrifice, hands that flung stars into space, to cruel nails surrendered. This is our God. The servant king, he calls us now to follow him, to bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the servant king. So let us learn how to serve. Serving. This is our God, the servant king. He calls us now to follow him, to bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the servant king. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we praise you that although you are worthy to be worshipped and obeyed as the King of all kings, yet you came to us humbly, even riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, and you surrendered your life so that we can live. Help us to follow your example of humility and service to never exalt ourselves, but rather to love one another, to put one another ahead of our own interests, and to love and worship you above all. For you, our servant king, are worthy of all this and more. Amen. Good morning, and thank you for joining us on this Palm Sunday. Today we enter Holy Week, the week leading up to Good Friday and Jesus' crucifixion, and then a week today to Easter Sunday and the glory of the resurrection. As we journey through this week, 
I encourage you to read the accounts of the days leading up to Good Friday in our four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You'll see how Jesus welcomes the needy, challenges the religious elite, speaks to Roman imperial power, tenderly cares for his disciples, celebrates the great Passover meal, and prays that his Father's will be done. Holy Week becomes the furnace that purifies us and prepares us for the horror of the cross and the hallelujah of the empty tomb. Let this be so this year, Lord, we pray. By now, I am sure you have heard about or seen the latest provincial guidelines about worship services. Our provincial health officer has said that outdoor services of up to 50 people and up to 50 cars are permitted. When the news broke on Tuesday afternoon, we explored a variety of options. You will have received an email and online registration information about what we propose. So next Sunday, we will have three services. The first one at 10 a.m. will be live streamed online. It will not be in person, but just online. It will be over Zoom and YouTube. And we will celebrate communion and hear an Easter message. For those joining us on Zoom, there will be translation into Mandarin and English and the opportunity to join breakout rooms afterwards. And I hope you can join us. And then at one o'clock and three o'clock, we will have outdoor services in the church parking lot. These are only by registration. If you're on Trinity's email contact list, you will have received details about registration already. And I hope you've been able to register. But I realize that because of the limits on numbers who can attend, not everyone will have been able to register. And I am sorry if you've not been able to register. But I do hope you can still join our live streamed online service at 10 o'clock. In fact, you'll probably be able to connect more readily with people in the breakout rooms. We are very grateful for your consideration and patience as we navigate these regulations and requirements. And let's continue to pray that the time will come soon when we can gather in person without the need for registration, health declarations, masks, and social distancing. But of course, before next Sunday, we have Good Friday. At 11 o'clock, we will have a live online meditation with scripture readings, prayers, hymns, and opportunities for quiet reflection. Again, this is not in person, but online. You will receive login details for Zoom and YouTube in the coming days. Thank you for your support for Trinity. Your prayers and giving make such a difference. We continue to reach out with the gospel, to care for one another, and to serve our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And you're welcome to give by mail to the church office, online through Canada Helps, or by e-transfer. All the information is on our website and in our weekly online bulletin. You're also welcome to call the church office if you need more information, to be added to our email contact list, or just to chat and pray with someone. Here's our contact information. It's also shown at the end of the service, and we'd love to hear from you. As we give praise to God with our offering, why not send a text greeting to someone? And as you send that text, here are a few more of your pictures of things you give thanks to God for. And may you know the Lord's encouragement and presence. Thank you.
Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we cry out to you, Hosanna, for you are the only one who saves us. We ask that you would help this suffering world, that you would save those who are suffering from loneliness, from lack of employment, and from disease, especially in this continuing pandemic. O oh Lord, bring help to those who are in most desperate need of medical care. O oh Lord, bring hope to those who are on the edge of despair. O oh Lord, turn hearts everywhere to trust you to save not only their bodies, but their souls as well. We turn our hearts to you, Lord Jesus, our conquering King, for you gave your life to save us from sin, from despair, and from death. Forgive us when we, like the crowds in Jerusalem in Holy Week, do not live up to the words of the praises we sing. Create in us faithful hearts to live for you and to share your good news with a heart of love for others. Fix in our hearts the unshakable hope of eternal life in you, that we would live faithfully and cheerfully for you in a world that is desperately in need of salvation as we welcome the day of your resurrection and as we eagerly await the day of your return. For you are worthy of all this and more. And we praise you, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hello, everyone, especially to the boys and girls watching today. Kids, I hope you are enjoying your spring break. And I'm sure you're enjoying sleeping in and maybe shooting some hoops, maybe in your own bubble with family members. I'm sure you're enjoying your free time these days. And maybe you are cozying up to a good book, maybe doing some good reading. Well, today is Palm Sunday, and so it is the Easter season. And I hope that you are getting ready for Easter as it is quickly approaching. Now, speaking about reading, I was at the library uh, quite recently, just yesterday, and I thought I'd share uh, another book with you. And this will be like a little bit of a guessing game as Easter is approaching. So, what am I? What could I be? Well, let me give you a clue here. Filled with grass, I hold all your Easter treasures. You can carry me while you hunt for Easter eggs. I think you know what it is. Well, let's flip the page and see exactly what it is. I am an Easter basket, that's me. Look at that. Okay, one more. Let's give you a clue first. I hop through your yard and hide colored Easter eggs for you. You will know me by my long ears and fluffy tail. Hmm, is that a giraffe, an elephant? Well, <laughs> of course not. Yeah. What am I? What could I be? It is, I'm a bunny, the Easter bunny. That's me. And then the last page here, what am I? What could I be? Well, look at this nice colorful page. I am Easter. That's me. But I'm pretty sure this is missing a couple things. I think we could have a cross here. I'm pretty sure we could have an empty tomb. That would be awesome if there was an empty tomb in this picture here. So as Easter approaches, I'm sure you will enjoy the, the candies, maybe some Easter eggs, but let us remember that it is about Jesus who came for us, who died for us, and on Easter, he is alive, he is risen, and he is no longer in the tomb. He has defeated death, and we are going to rise too, just like Jesus did, and be with our God in heaven. So we have so much to be thankful for this season. I want to encourage you to 
enjoy this Easter season and be, and be part of our Easter activities here at Trinity Baptist Church, and I hope to see you very soon. Right now, let's just pray and thank God for today, and th indeed, thank God for this Easter season. Let's pray. Dear Lord, you are our God. Hosanna, Hosanna, you are our Savior. Thank you, Lord God, that you saved us from our sin. Lord, as Good Friday is approaching, I pray that we would remember what you did for us on the cross. But as Easter approaches, I pray that we would rejoice and celebrate the miracle of the resurrection. You are no longer in your tomb. I pray that you would teach the children more fully about what you have done for us and how we have life in you. I thank you for each one watching. I pray for each boy and girl watching that they would know you more through our sermon today. I pray, Lord, that you would continue to be with each and every child during this spring break, and may they come to know you more fully, for your, your love is so unconditional. Your love is so great. Your grace is so awesome. Thank you that your grace is sufficient. I pray that they may know more about your grace today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. John 12, verses 20 to 26. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you. And as a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. In Penticton, I had the reputation for burning food. One time, we had the youth group visit and I prepared pizza. The cooking instructions said, Place in oven at 425 degrees for 18 to 20 minutes. Seemed straightforward enough. After 20 minutes, I took the pizza out of the oven only to discover it had a black, crispy shell. I still served it to the youth and told them that a small amount of carbon never hurt anyone. Now, such culinary success is dwarfed by my barbecue skills. For years, each week after the Sunday service, we invited people to our home for lunch. Most Sundays, we had nearly 50 people. Once spring and summer arrived, food was cooked on our barbecue, and this meant hamburgers. I'd cook the burgers, but there was always a degree of concern among our guests. You see, once, and only once, I burned the burgers. And since that fateful day, everyone said, I always burn the burgers. In fact, some in the church joked that my burgers were more like hockey pucks, hard, tough, and should be used in Olympic ice hockey finals. You get the picture. Now, I will dispute all these unfair, callous, and degrading accusations against my cooking. But for many in Penticton, I was so bad at cooking that I could overcook a salad or burn ice cream. It's no surprise that the culinary genius in our kitchen is not me. It's Catherine, my wife. 
So why tell you this? It's not because I want to stop you enjoying a burger cooked on my barbecue. It's because to cook well requires timing. Cook something for too long and it burns. Cook something for not long enough and it's inedible. And it's not just cooking. Many things in life are about timing. Ignition timing in a car. Timing when telling a joke. Rhythm and timing in music. Even timing in video recording. When we record our services, the sound is recorded on one device and the video on another. You don't see it, but before each segment, there's a visible loud clap. So the timing of the video and the audio can be synchronized perfectly. In the Bible, timing matters. Just look at Christmas. Galatians 4 verse 4 says, when the time had fully come, God sent his son. Jesus' birth wasn't accidental, but perfectly timed in God's plan of salvation. And look at the end of time when Christ returns. Ephesians 1 verse 10 says, all things in heaven and on earth will be brought under one head, Christ, when the times have reached their fulfillment. Timing matters. It's the same for Jesus' death on the cross. The time was perfect. The time had come. And that's what Palm Sunday and our scripture today is all about. Many of us are familiar with the story of Palm Sunday. Passover, the greatest festival in Israelite history, was just a few days away. Passover was the celebration of God's deliverance of the people of Israel from the hands of the Egyptians some 1,300 years before. And crowds are gathering in Jerusalem. And what's more, everyone is full of expectation. If God had delivered the Israelites from the oppressive Egyptians centuries before, maybe this year God will send a chosen king to deliver the people of Israel from the Romans. And many believe one man is this chosen king, Jesus. Remember, Jesus had healed the sick, raised the dead, fed the crowds, comforted the hurting, challenged the arrogant, taught the scriptures, and preached the good news of God's grace and love. So when Jesus makes his way into Jerusalem, many believe the time has come. It's why crowds wave palm branches and lay cloaks on the ground, and they shout, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. But Jesus isn't the conquering victor they expect such a person to be. Jesus hasn't come to destroy the Romans. He's come to do something much more important. He's come to announce salvation, the deliverance from sin and death, and the victory of God over all evil, sin, and the devil. This is why Jesus rides on a donkey, a symbol of humility, as ancient prophecy described. Zechariah 9 verse 9 announces, Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey colt. Now, the timing is still important. But for Jesus, it carries much greater meaning. In their Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell us that Jesus entered the temple and threw over the tables of the moneylenders. As Holy Week begins, I encourage you to read of the events of this week in those Gospels. But today I want to look at John's Gospel, because John focuses on a different detail on Palm Sunday, and it's all about timing. Look what happens in John's Gospel as soon as Jesus enters Jerusalem. Now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, 
We would like to see Jesus. John 20, verses 20 and 21. This simple question from these Greeks, these non-Jews, is so important. It's a defining moment in God's plan of salvation. And their question has all to do with timing. Remember how John's gospel shows us seven signs that point to who Jesus is. The first sign was when Jesus turned water into wine in John 2 verses 1 to 12. Jesus is, is with his mom, Mary, at a wedding. And the wine runs out and Mary asks him to do something about it. Listen to what Jesus says. My time has not yet come. John chapter 2 verse 4. And now look at John 7 verse 30. Jesus is in Jerusalem teaching. He says that God the Father sent him. Some listening try to seize him but fail because his time had not yet come. And the same happens in John chapter 8, verse 20. No one seizes Jesus because his time had not yet come. Now, fast forward to John 13, verse 1. This is Jesus' last supper, the Passover feast, just a few hours before Jesus is crucified for the sins of the world. John 13 verse 1 says, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Or look at John 17 verse 1. Again, just before Jesus is betrayed and crucified, Jesus prays, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. Notice the change. Earlier in John's Gospel, at the wedding, or when people wanted to seize him, Jesus' time had not yet come. But later, at the Last Supper, and in his great prayer to the Father before he is arrested and crucified, Jesus says the time, or hour in some translations, has come. Why the change? What happens to show us, to show Jesus, that the time or hour has come. It's the Greeks asking to see Jesus. Look at our scripture today. As soon as Philip and Andrew tell Jesus about the Greeks, this is what Jesus says. The hour has come for the Son of Man, that's Jesus, to be glorified. John 12 verse 23. The hour has come. The signal that changes everything, that moves the minute hand to the hour on the clock of salvation's plan, is this request by non-Jews to see Jesus. In other words, Jesus could not go to the cross until the cross meant salvation, not just for Jews, but for everyone, including you and me. Palm Sunday is when John chapter 3 verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, is no longer words on Jesus' lips to a Jewish leader, as we read in John chapter 3, but becomes an invitation offered to the whole world to come to the cross, find forgiveness, and know God through Jesus Christ. The hour has come, the time is now. How does this speak to you and me as we enter Holy Week? The question of these Greeks tells us that God's timing with regard to his plan of salvation for the world is perfect. And we can think about this in, in two ways. First, salvation is assured. What Jesus achieves on the cross is what God wants each of us to know in our lives. That the cross is God's work to restore each of us back into relationship with him. Maybe your question, whether it's possible to know God. Just over a week ago, my teenage daughter asked me why, of all the religions and faiths in the world, I chose Christianity. 
The answer is this. Every religion, faith, belief, tells us what we must do or be like to reach God. You know, to be good, be kind, be thoughtful, be generous, be law-abiding, and so on. And it's right to be good, kind, thoughtful, generous, and law-abiding. But as Mark magnificently reminded us last week, doing good or being good can never be good enough. God is utterly holy and perfect, and we can't reach up to him. But, and here's why Christianity makes so much sense, God reaches down to us. In fact, he does more. He comes among us as one of us, Jesus. Christianity is not about me being perfect. It's about me being the object of God's love. It's not about what I do. It's about what Jesus has done. So it is possible to know God. Jesus has made it possible. The cross and the resurrection of Jesus from the dead lie at the center of Christianity. Just listen to what Jesus says only a few verses later in John chapter 12, verses 31 and 32. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And John immediately adds in verse 33, he said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. Everything that keeps me and you separate from God, our sin, our pride, our self-interest, our rebellion against God, deserves judgment. We've turned our back on God, and he has every right to cast us aside. But he doesn't. Because of his love for us, Jesus who in very nature is God, as the Bible says, takes the judgment we deserve. He dies instead of us. John 15 verse 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And now we are free to return to God and know him personally. When the Greeks asked to see Jesus, and when Jesus hears their request, he, know, he knows the hour has come. His death upon the cross, being lifted up, as he says in John 12, verse 32, tells us that salvation is assured. You don't need to sit on the fence. You don't need to live with uncertainty. You don't need to live with fear of the future or of death. The way of salvation is open to you. The cross proves it. The hour has come. And second, and just as amazing, is how the request of the Greeks to see Jesus opens the window on God's love for everyone. Reconciliation is proclaimed. Remember, it's the request of these Greeks, these non-Jews, that signals the hour has come. Coming to the cross, following Jesus as Lord, means we enter God's family. A family made up of people from all walks of life, all nationalities, all backgrounds. Salvation has never been limited to just one group of people. Even in the first half of the Bible, which tells of God's work among the Israelites, God's special people called to live for him and demonstrate his glory in the promised land, there was always room for those outside. Rahab, a prostitute in Jericho, a Canaanite, or Ruth, a Moabite, a people who were the enemies of the Israelites, put their trust in God and were received into his people. We see this even more in the gospel accounts of Jesus' ministry. He saves a Samaritan woman. He heals a Roman centurion servant. He touches lepers and outcasts. He welcomes tax collectors who were in the pay of the Roman Empire. And after the resurrection of Jesus, when the church is sent out into the world, it is not to a particular ethnic or racial group. It is to everyone. Go and make disciples of all nations. 
says Jesus in Matthew 28, verse 19. We live in a world fractured by racial division. Not a day goes by without hearing of violence against people of color, blacks, Asians, First Nations. And we need the reconciliation of the gospel in our world today. For the first 36 years of my life, I lived in northwest London, England. There's a district in London called Greenwich. Through Greenwich, the Prime Meridian runs. The Prime Meridian is the north-south line that defines time zones around the world and separates east and west. I have stood in Greenwich, literally one foot in the eastern hemisphere and one foot in the western hemisphere. But there's a greater prime meridian, the cross. The cross is the prime meridian that brings east and west together, that breaks down racial division. We sing, in Christ there is no east or west, in him no north or south, but one great fellowship of love throughout the whole wide earth. We are one in Christ, Galatians 3 verse 28. The visible answer to Jesus' prayer in John 17 verse 22, that we may be one. You see, here's a profound truth of the gospel. As a black Bible scholar put it, looking at this scripture in John 12, our life together is not an implication of the gospel. It is a manifestation of the gospel. The Greeks' request to see Jesus and Jesus' response at the time had come is God's word to us, Trinity Baptist, as we look forward to returning to in-person gatherings this year. Jesus says to you and me, stand on the prime meridian, the gospel, and rededicate yourselves to my mission to this world, to embrace and be embraced by one another, no matter our race, our language, our culture, our age, our country, our gender, our money. The hour has come. This is the gospel. Some of you have heard me tell this story before. Many years ago, Catherine and I were enjoying an evening at home. I think it was a Saturday evening. All my pastoral duties were complete, and she and I were getting ready for Sunday and leading the service. There was a knock on the door. A young woman, an Asian woman, whom we'd never met before, stood on the doorstep. I can't remember her exact words, but the gist of what she said was the same as the Greeks when they spoke to Philip. I want to see Jesus. This young woman wanted to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And that Saturday evening, we told her the gospel and she gave her life to Jesus. And today, she's a leader in the church I pastored in England. The hour came for her. Palm Sunday released the sovereign plan of God. The request of the Greeks moved everything from the time is not yet to now is the time. Now salvation is assured. Now reconciliation is proclaimed. The hour, the time is for you too. Good Friday approaches. Jesus offers you the way to life, the way to live. Receive him and come. Be part of his family. Amen.
go now into the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Never fail to wonder at the death of his passion. Never fail to offer thanksgiving for the unsurpassable gift of reconciliation to God, which he has given. Never fail to live as his servants, trusting in the power of his reign. Let us pray. Almighty God, look with favor on your family, we pray, the ones for whom Christ suffered and died. May the love of Christ be upon you all. Amen. So come and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus with us next week, either in person or online. See you next week. Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say rejoice. His kingdom cannot fail, he rules o'er earth and hell. The keys of death and hell are to our Jesus give. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again. I say rejoice, rejoice in glorious hope. Our Lord the Judge shall come and take his servants up to their eternal home. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say.